Welcome everybody to another edition of Coffee and Open Source, a place to meet some new friends, have some great conversations, and maybe learn something along the way. I'm your host, Isaac Levin. And if you're enjoying the conversations here, be sure to like, subscribe, follow wherever you're watching or listening. Also, if you're interested or know any folks that would be interested in being on the show and chatting with me, feel free to reach out to me on Twitter. My handle there is IsaacR11 or on Mastodon at IsaacR11 at Fostodon.org. All right. So with that out of the way, I'm looking forward to our guest. We were having some great conversation before we got started. And let's just jump right into it. So my guest today, excuse me, is Dayan Milishek. Dayan, do you want to say hello and introduce yourself? Hello. Thank you for having me. So uh, I'm developer who turned from individual contributor, not into the management, not into old, uh, like, middle-aged developer, I became developer advocate, which is some kind of middle career path. So sure. I'm actually writing code, but I don't have deadlines anymore, which is the best of both worlds. Yeah, and I, I like to say that uh, I gave up on shipping software many years ago. So now it's nice. I'm a developer advocate as well as, as most of the folks uh, that are tuning in know. And uh, it's, it's nice to not have like the pressure of shipping software, at least for me. Um, Excellent. So I'm looking forward to the conversation and I love to start our, our chats with, you know, if you want to tell me about your, your tech origin story. So do you remember a point in time when you came across a, a computer or technology in general and you're like, okay, this is the thing. I want to work on this. I want to be, uh, I want to play with computers for the rest of my life. So this happened like a long, long time ago. <laughs> sure, sure. In 1986. So this was an era before the internet, before the Java was invented, before, I don't know, all over Berlin Wall. Uh, I was uh, something like 13 and I uh, learned about this thing, like personal computers, so I got excited. I was bugging my parents until they, uh, they got me one and I started doing basic in my room in the evenings on the small TV set on, on my table. CRT, of course. Yeah, no, that is awesome. So you got like your own little computing area at home. That's uh, that's kind of rare for that point in time, right? Yes. Yeah. But uh, it was it was really really exciting. So I it was Atari eight hundred XL. I still remember the the shape and the smell and the colors. Yeah. Now that's fun. So you know, at what point in time did you realize? Like, obviously, if you're doing it at a young age. Did you realize pretty quickly that it was something that you can make a career out of or was it something that you were so interested in doing that it didn't really matter? Like you just wanted to work on it. At that point in time, I decided, OK, this is what I'm going to do. This is going to be my career choice. So when I was enrolling high school, I was living in, in a country where you could choose uh, different subspecialties of the high school. So I picked up mathematics oriented one. And then later on, I, uh, I went to the university. Uh, I studied uh, computer science, which is a combination of uh, mathematics and engineering. So it was like I decided rather early what I want to do in my life. And yeah. I was lucky enough that this was not something obscure later on. It, it became mainstream and I'm making a good living out of it and I'm yeah. enjoying it. So it's like dream came true, essentially. Yeah. So you get you got started working in, in basic, right? So, uh, you know, at what and you know, at what point in time, like obviously, at, you know, over the course of time, languages change. So, like, at what point in time did you like find a language that you really liked working on and you kind of stuck with that language? Is it C sharp, F sharp? So actually, I. I uh, slided from, uh, well, it was uh, basic in the beginning, then mm -hmm. it was Turbo Pascal, and then was it was Delphi, and then Delphi unfortunately died. <laughs> so I switched, I, I skipped over Visual Basic. I want, uh, I'll be polite and I'll be nice. <laughs> sure, I want sure, Common sure, sure, Visual sure. Basic sure. As, a, as like direction. And then it was C Sharp, and then I started like, uh, after some time spent in, in Microsoft ecosystem, I started picking outside, learn some interesting things. And you could say that nowadays C Sharp and F Sharp are, are my primary languages mm -hmm. of choice. So when I want yeah. to build something, well, for the past year or two, F Sharp is my primary, primarily choice for building things. That's great. So um, one of the questions that I love to ask folks is like, 
when did it click for you? Like, when did you realize that you had an interest not just in working with computers like to make money or potentially as a career, but like when you started doing things like as a hobby? Like, you know, I, I'd imagine somebody like you, they, they have a lot of different interests in technology and like you can't fit all of them into one job. So you do a little bit on the side. Like, when did you realize that like, hobby development or being a technologist as a hobby was going to be something interesting for you? Well, essentially from the very, very first day. So let me tell you a story. One of the job interviews uh, I, for the positions, for the position I got, uh, one of the question, what questions was, what's your hobby? Mm -hmm. And then in the millisecond, you, you start thinking, okay, my hobby is also software development and I do this in the evenings. I work on the open source projects. Yep. I play around with the technology. So should I stay that my hobby is also software development programming or not? I don't want to be too geeky. So it, it, I had to make a split second decision and I said, okay, my hobby is also software development yep. and CTO who was interviewing me was, was, uh, uh, like-minded so it went well but it yeah. was like i was thinking will i be too like nerdy for for this company? yeah that's a that's an interesting thought like am i too nerdy to get a job in software development that's kind of interesting right because i think that there is kind of a, a misconception that you know you have to be nerdy to get a job as a software developer but i think that the real the, the realistic thing is that a lot of people like they build software for a living or they work in technology for a living. But outside of that, they don't really care. They don't want to play around technology. They don't want to keep fresh. They don't want to learn the latest thing because it does, it's, doesn't really directly affect their job. Um, and and if, as somebody who is kind of the, the adverse of that, where maybe you thought you were a bit too nerdy or too geeky or whatever, um, you know, how has that contributed to kind of different areas of technology? Like what are some areas of technology that you find interesting? Well, uh, I, I try to read a lot, think a lot, learn new things, and uh, I, I have, I'm very dissatisfied with like uh, state of our industry and our profession. If you, if you if you look at it, if you compare us to civil engineers, for example, sure, they have all these various uh, procedures and guilds and everything that established over the centuries. Mm -hmm. And uh, in our profession, it all comes down to your personal ethics. Will you go on the LinkedIn and say, "Okay, I'm uh, this and that," or yep. will you be, will you be humble, which I think you should be, to to certain extent? And then I started uh, thinking and and studying how how we could make better software because yep. you see, today we will be programming not only ATMs. We're we're going to be uh, producing. Uh, autonomous uh, cars and uh, well software is penetrating so i yep. feel a bit of responsibility about that so i start i got interested in uh, various methods of producing solid and reliable software no that's that i mean that makes a lot of sense and I, I, there's a couple of things that you said there that i i love to kind of you know uh kind of de delve into a little bit like the the idea that when you compare like software engineering to to other to more practical engineering like civil civil engineering or mechanical engineering like there are trade schools for it there are um like there are guilds like organized labor right there are some of these things right so why do you think that doesn't exist in technology i think we are we're still well i personally do not know any developer who retired so we are all <laughs> still young. So this is like infancy of, of software engineering. And if you look, uh, for example, look at the JavaScript, look at the pace and, and the, uh, how many frameworks were generated over the past two years, for example. So you can see things are still not stabilized enough. So I think we're, we're just starting. And I hope uh, some things will emerge before someone from the outside imposes uh, some kind of standards and certificates or whatever on us. Yeah. Because I... unfortunately, I'm afraid that sooner or later there will be some kind of software developer induced 
catastrophe and then there will be some committees by politicians or whoever mm. and uh, it won't be nice yeah i mean i don't it, it is funny that you bring up a couple of things that there's been movies made to an extent about you know the idea that like a oh, one line of code can cause a lot of problems or whatever right um I, it, that is interesting i wonder is it something that's i and, and this isn't to asking you to solve the problem but is it something that it is fixable in the current climate we have or is it something that we need to really really think rethink how we as technologists communicate with computers and others in other forms of technology something that we need to change like at our base or is it something that we can we can fix in, in a somewhat short amount of time well i would say lots of things should be fixed but one of the things that i like to uh, insist on is kind of personal integrity mm -hmm. so we i'm i'm coming from the country where outsourcing is number one uh, sure industry and uh, you know there's with with young developers uh building software uh their companies are just looking at the simple matrix of uh, hours spent hours invoiced so lots of corners are cut and young developers are simply not uh, not experienced enough to to defend what they are doing mm. so i think uh working with with young people to develop integrity to develop pers like professional standards also building some kind of local communities uh, that could uh, give example to, to young developers would help shape up our profession a bit that is interesting like i've never i haven't thought much about like at the college or the university curriculum level right having you know technology ethics or how to contribute to technology in an ethical way like as an actual course or a, an area of study that's very interesting i've never maybe i'm cut a bit different that i just assume like my my whole thing is like just do the right thing and the expectation is that other people will do the right thing but obviously that's not very true um it's interesting i i honestly would be very curious to see you know computer science programs or information systems programs pick up like ethical computing as like required study to be able to get a job in in technology um it's a bit harder because there i think there are so many ways to get into technology now like you don't need to go to university anymore you can be self-taught you can you know go to you know coding boot camps you can do all these sort of things and i think a lot of people focus on getting a job by any means necessary and then you'll figure it out once you get the job and then they put themselves in a position where they're immediately unhappy because they're not liking the work they're doing you know i you know and i don't know if they have this um where you're from but when i was growing up there was this idea of like the an aptitude test like you would kind of get asked a bunch of questions and they were like okay you know it's when you're younger like you know 10 or 11 years old you ask a bunch of questions you answer a bunch of questions and they tell you this is the kind of job that you might have that you'd be interested in doing. I wonder if there's something like that for technology. Like, you know, oh, not as something as simple like, oh, you want to work in React. Like, that, not something that's like, but oh, like you want to solve business problems or you want to solve performance problems or what have you, right? Because I think there's different skill sets that align to different practical practicums in this industry. Well, I just remembered something that I was thinking about the other day. Uh, I was speaking with a couple of people working in HR and they have all these tests mm -hmm. and my personal measurement of my advancement in career and in life is when I look back how I was doing thing, things six months ago, if I see mm. difference, this means that I'm changing, not necessarily always for the better, but sure. I'm attempting to change myself. Yeah. And then I was thinking like, okay, they in HR uh, departments, they do all these aptitude tests and other kinds of personality tests and scoring and uh, modeling personalities yep. and then they're doing the same thing for the past one or two decades to the best of my knowledge and i was thinking like they should be embracing some kind of engineering mindset or scientific approach yeah. okay let's try to analyze success of our tests and let's compare this uh, if this can be correlated to actual performance of people and I think I read somewhere that 
Google is not using these famous how many uh, ping pong balls you can uh, sure. fit into the yeah. bus or something like that because of, if I remember correctly, they analyzed uh, correlation between uh, these tests and the actual performance uh, in, in various uh, categories in the yeah. workplace and apparently they ha they found there's no correlation. Yeah, I mean, that is interesting to say. It's like, you know, and I think a lot of technology companies, rightfully so, have moved away from like the, the got you interview questions, right? Like, uh, you know, how many ping pong balls, that's like the how many to fill up a whatever, like fill up a car. Like, I think those are interesting thought experiments is like how you go about solving problems. But in an analytical way. But, it, but I think at, end, at the end of the day, it's they're not ideal for a lot of reasons. I think it, it's it's problematic, at least from my perspective, because it, you, you get to solutioning too fast. I think a lot of us in technology are very guilty of the of solutioning too fast, trying to solve the problem immediately without thinking about what the the overarching goal that you're trying to solve is with the solution, right? Um, I think at, at the end of the day too, like it's very very problematic to just assume that the first answer you come up with is the answer that's going to be the best one, and I think a lot of people, if we could just take a step back realize very very quickly that that's not the best way to go about doing things also these like uh was was the name for the test uh for the interviews where you where you uh, do some kind of live coding i'm yep. i'm really really bad at that i like to sit down think about the problem and then produce code in the end but this like kind of pressure even after after 20 something years of experience as, as a software developer, I would, I think I would fail those tests. Oh, I mean, I, I've been very vocal in my career about, you know, I am not the best developer by any means. So what ends up happening is I immediately get a bit, that's the best way to phrase this. I get a bit anxious when I take tests. So the idea of like taking tests and like how in that that you know affecting my potentially getting a job is very very challenging right so and i think that there's there's something to say it's like not everybody works in a vacuum very very well right um but i think the one thing that's very very important to call out is people solve problems at a different pace and some people they go about solving problems a bit slower they provide substantially more better more thought out solutions right you see uh, diversity is a big thing thing these days so we should also adapt neurodiversity a tab that not everyone is working at the same pace uh, during the course of my career i spent a couple of years and as a manager and uh, my philosophy was that every one of us has some kind of uh, maximum velocity and my job was to provide environment for these people to move as close as possible to their maximum velocity. But if you try to push them over this, this, this is a mistake. This is a big mistake. Mm -hmm. As a manager, you shouldn't be doing that. You should be providing perfect environment to, of course, uh, within the reasonable boundaries for people to do the best they can and as long as they are trying to to, to give the best they can that's it yeah. yeah i mean it seems quite simple right but like i think when you start like at the end of the day a, a goal of a company is to hire who they see is the best possible candidate right and we're very and and usually it's not something that you like i've seen a lot of companies try like the okay here's a here's an assignment Here's all the information that you need from the assignment, and you can come back in a few days with the answer to the assignment. That's interesting. Um, I've seen other companies do like, you know, it's you're working with a team, and each person on the team has a particular task, and and you're reporting back your findings from each individual in the team. That's interesting as well. But like, you never really know if somebody is going to be effective on your team until they've started. So there's always a risk, right? And I think a lot of companies, their goal is to minimize the amount of risk as possible. So there's a couple of things that they do. 
Like they'll ask you to write, write code on a whiteboard or they'll ask you, you know, the ping pong ball question. Um, at the end of the day, it's, it's very, it, there's a lot of risk involved in hiring people. And I think one of the things that we need to figure out an effective way to do is, is to make sure that folks, what's the best way to phrase this? Make sure that folks are upfront and aware of all the things that could potentially, you know, I'm, I'm trying to figure out a good way to phrase this and I can't, I'm, we'll move on to another, another thought. But I think that the goal should be is that effective hiring is the most important part of the job, not just for the individual who's looking for the job, but for the company as well. Um, but I think, I, yeah. uh, well, I think that the, the topic besides the coffee and like open source, is yeah. the topic of this podcast, I think open source contributions are perfect coding, mm-hmm. like, uh, proof of, of coding skills for anyone who applies sure if you if you think about it yeah you're looking at someone who is a contributor to open source which means that this person is passionate about this technology this is someone spending uh, free time coding uh, this person is able to accommodate a diverse group of people working yeah. on this open source project fit in collaborate contribute and uh, I couldn't think of better, and it's also highly ethical if we want to characterize it that way. You're contributing for free uh, to, to, to good mm-hmm. causes. So I think this is perfect, perfect uh, validation of, of both social skills and the coding skills, uh, technology, proficiency, uh, collaboration, everything. You have everything in one place. I don't disagree. I think that one of the biggest, I guess, counter arguments to that is that most people open source contribute contribution isn't a part of their work so when you run the risk of like like there's you know you've seen memes on the internet right where it's like oh you have to have like your github like calendar has to be all green right um and i don't and I don't, I don't think you're saying that i think you're saying that a healthy understanding of open source principles and how to contribute effectively in open source and how to engage the community is important for the job, which I totally agree with. Um, I just think that there is, for whatever reason, a lot of people treat your GitHub profile as a part of your resume, which it is, but it's not the only piece of your resume, right? I totally agree. My point was, if I'm if I'm interviewing you, yep. if you don't have a single commit on the GitHub, okay. But if you are active contributor, yes. then I just verified a couple of things and we can proceed. I'm just skipping these like 15 yes. points and we can start from the 16th point. Yeah, it's a pretty valuable tool, I will say. Like being able to look at somebody's, I guess, developer social media profile is very valuable. I, I just, I weary that I'm wary of like it being like a checkbox for a lot of organizations like oh you have to have a github repo and you have to have x amount of contributions in a year right like that starts to become like very problematic right because then you're kind of fitting people into boxes where they might you know if you work at a, a company that doesn't work with open source of open technology I, I, you run the risk of missing out on candidates right um i know yeah. some great developers who at 5 p.m just turn the things off yeah. and walk away and they are back at 9 a.m. next morning and they are great developers. So uh, I, I I totally accept all the all lifestyles and career choices. Yeah. But as I said, if if you instead of uh, asking people to do some live coding, say you should better if you can, of course, take a look at the code they yeah. wrote yeah, in oh, the yes. piece of, of the night. Yeah, no, okay. <laughs> no, that's yeah. I don't know if anybody wants to read my code that I write late at night, but that's a different conversation for a different day. Um, yeah, and I think even to like to even go one step further, like depending on where you are in your life, like you might be somebody who loves contributing open source, but you just don't for X amount of time. Like I'm very guilty of that. Like I'll fall in and out of it where I'll work late at night writing some code and then there'll be weeks where I don't do it at all. I sign off at five and I go about my life. Right. And I think it's, it's important to also mention that like, it also shows your area of interest too. Like you can, if you look at any, buddy in technology that has a github profile you can figure out like what kind of stuff they like working on 
or what's interesting them to them in tech. If they're opening up issues in these certain repositories, like, oh, it probably means they're using them for something. If they're writing code in these particular areas, oh, they must love to write code in Rust or code in C Sharp or whatever. Uh, and I think or that that's really valuable. You. I can tell you my story. I still remember you asked me about if I remember my entrance into technology. I can tell you about my first pull request. Oh, I'd love to hear that. Yeah. So it was N2 CMS open source, uh, open source uh, content management system. And I was following and I wanted to contribute, but I had this pressure that whole world is going to observe what I'm doing there. You know, mm -hmm. so much of a pressure. So I. I still remember I I wrote the code function or method which is generating slug from the title of the web page yeah, is generating sure. URL slug. I think if I remember correctly, I wrote 126 unit tests to verify that. Because I wow. I was feeling so much of a responsibility and it took me so long to write it because okay, now whole wide internet is going to look at my code and they yeah. will be pinpointing this and that. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's the problem of putting your code on the internet, right? Like, you run the risk of people wanting to up, alter your code, right? Um, I've struggled with that a lot in in open source. In as somebody who has maintained an open source an open source project, like. I have gone back and forth to like, oh, I want contributors, but I also don't want people to just come in and like rewrite a lot of my code base because when they leave. I have to manage it and I don't know what they wrote, right? Because so there's a healthy balance. So I respect folks that have like very strong uh, code contribution guidelines. I really respect those folks. But at the same time, the more stringent your code contribution guidelines are, the larger barrier to entry it is for folks that might want to contribute to your project. That's why I always talk about like there are alternatives to writing code to contribute. Like there's writing documentation, there's writing, there's opening pull requests, there's like what you like writing unit tests, right? Like you ask a developer who runs an open source project and you contact them, hey, do you want, do you need somebody to help you with docs and writing unit tests? They would love you forever, right? Because that's like the things especially that developers Especially for the documentation. Yeah. Especially. especially documentation is like weakest points of every single open source project, I think. This is mm -hmm. usually the boring task. So if you <laughs> yeah. if you're a young developer, if you approach uh, uh, some project which is interesting, if you start contributing to the documentation, you will have some experience with uh, basic uh, Git operations like forking yeah. and creating pull requests. So you will train yourself in that. You will also be able to put contributions on your CV, and overall, you will. It's a win-win-win. Yeah, everyone will benefit. Yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree. It, it's it's quite fascinating too. Like, and I, this is kind of goes into this next area that I'd love to talk about is like what you're currently doing, right? So, you know, for the folks who don't know, Dan he works at RavenDB, and I'd love to kind of get your thoughts around because when we think about open source, we think about code, right, and applications and software. We typically don't think about database platforms. Like, uh, and not to say that database platforms aren't open source. There's a ton of them, right? But like, we don't think of like, okay, what's the what's the contribution mechanism for data platforms that are open source? First off, I'd love to kind of get your thoughts about what interested you so much about working on database sources or data solutions in the that are open source. Like that, that's a good place to start. Like, what was interesting to you about that? Well, what, when you when you look at the databases as uh as area, I think uh -huh. the only thing that's closest to the mat, uh, closer to the metal is operating system. So it's uh, when you start, when you go to the, when you enroll university, you will learn about the databases, and it's a bit like magic box. <laughs> yeah, well, it is. And, it is. You you throw and, and a you, you throw a query yeah. at it, and you get some data back. That is it. I, that's it. Right. And then you swipe your your card, uh, yep. and then the transaction goes through. And then you think, okay, how many well, uh, on the, on the grand scale of the world economy, how many people are swiping cards at the same moment, and mm -hmm. how many people are buying, uh, I don't know, airline tickets, and everything works just like that. Yeah. So it, that's that's interesting. It it is interesting because I, I think one of the things that at least as somebody who 
you know, good, bad or indifferent has kind of fallen into like, oh, relational databases. Like I've always kind of worked in relational databases. And obviously there are some very, very well-known ones that are run by large organizations. And there's a couple of ones that are open source. Um, and, you know, I haven't done a lot of real like large solutions using like the NoSQL or the document style database like as much like I guess what do you think it is about like the NoSQL approach that is more I guess interesting in the open source community versus the re more traditional relational model right because most of the open source database platforms that you're aware that I'm aware of most of them are are NoSQL there's not very, not very, there's a few that are relational, but most of them are NoSQL. Yeah, there, there's like a, a, like historic inception of that, starting with the Oracle in '79, which was first uh, relation commercial relational database, yeah. then IBM, and then in the '80s, of course, no open source of of the kind that we know, and then in the '90s, uh, companies doing things on a grand scale like. Uh, Google or Yahoo started developing specific solutions to solve their specific problems. So, for example, with Google, it was about how we can distribute uh, all these workloads on many, many small uh, machines, which are cheap, which are disposable, which you just can replace around. And uh, there's some kind of trans tradition for the NoSQL to be open source. Mm -hmm. and, and then what is especially interesting for me with, uh, with RavenDB, for example, is RavenDB is not just open source in the terms of the license. Uh, there, there's there's quite different difference between being legally bounded by the terms of your open source license, which means that if you go and request uh, source code from me, I must give you source code. Sure. It's it's also about the spirit because if you go to the GitHub of RavenDB, you can see whole development team creating pull requests, commenting. Everything is transparent, which is for me fascinating. Yeah. So whole company is transparent. Everything is open, and at the same time, you're building a really, really big company on something which is completely available to anyone. Yeah, it is interesting. Like, and I mean, you said something a, a little bit ago that I kind of I, I glossed over, and it kind of bubbled up into my mind again. Like, you know, the most it's. Database platforms are as complicated, if not more complicated in a lot of cases, as operating systems, right? And, and you know, I, I think of, like, what is involved in a database engine, right? So, like, you have all these different layers of interfacing with the I.O., interfacing with resources, interfacing with disk, interfacing with whatever. And then, like, to the developer or whoever is engaging with that database, it's just this top-level API, right? And, but everything underneath that is extremely complicated. I mean, when you first started working with data stores, like when did you realize how complicated it really was? Because I imagine initially as a developer, your first contact with databases was like, oh, I'm going to write a SQL query or I'm going to write some query of some, of some form to get back some result set. Well, let me tell you straight away. The moment you open uh, source code of any database, yeah. You will be looking, for example, if it's if it is the case of RavenDB, which is written in C sharp, which is again quite fascinating using yeah. language like C sharp for producing something like that piece of assistance software. You start looking at the C sharp, and this is not looking like a C sharp. It is C sharp. You can co go and compile it, but you're looking at the maybe even keywords you were not aware exist or you never saw being used in the wild, and uh, it's not. It's not normal C sharp. It's highly optimized. <laughs> sure, it's, sure. Uh, it's not pointers, but everything else but the pointers. You're managing your own uh, um, memory allocation arena. You're uh, allocating, keeping references, memory map files, all, all this kind of magic. So it's it's. I I would I would say it's like what you were labeling as a young person, real program. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's fair to say is it's like, you know, when you think about building a, a uh, an application or building a solution, right? Usually, like, what are the components to it? Oh, I have a UI, I'm building, maybe I'm accessing some, some data somewhere. And I think, and it, 
I guess it's it's hard for me to comprehend. It's like, well, a database engine is an application. It is a solution because it's interfacing with system resources, it's interfacing with disk, and it has a UI, right? In some cases, the UI is command line based, and sometimes it has a, a cool interface, right? Um, it, I, I want to talk about like the C sharp aspect, right? I'm a C sharp developer. I've been a C sharp developer for most of my professional career, and the idea that of build, about building a, a database platform in C sharp or mostly in C sharp is completely crazy to me. Like, and I'd love to kind of get your thoughts as like, and obviously you weren't one of the original people who like came up with the initial concept and wrote it, but like, you know, what is it about C sharp? Like it, or there are probably other languages that other database platforms are written in, but why C sharp do you think? So just to be fair and, and honest here, I, I'm actually just the observer to, to yeah. put it that way. So Oren, yeah. Orenini, sure. uh, pen name Mayanda, he was the one who, who started it. So I'm contributing here and there uh, uh, small bits and pieces. But uh, uh, when I was talking with the team, uh, whole philosophy is that for, uh, for small performance gains, you do small things. For huge, big performance gains, you do big architectural things. Sure. One of those choices is not to fight operating system, but rather to embrace it and use it to your advantage. Mm -hmm. uh, then when you look at it, uh, C Sharp and the .NET framework is built on common language runtime, which has been hugely optimized. And then you are also gaining uh, benefits from that. Sure. But this is a great example that you, it's not up to the language. You know, I think there's a misconception that, okay, this language is for business applications like F sharp is for mathematical applications. Sure. You cannot write this or that. It turns out when you look at the, at the RavenDB, when you, when you look at, at the, how it operates, how it behaves, how it's, it's delivering huge loads, then you see it's all about the architecture, about decisions. It's not, Language is actually your friend, not not the obstacle. It should be your excuse if if your software is slow. Yeah, I mean, I I guess like as somebody who's been a C sharp or .NET developer for a long time, like you know, it's only been in the last few years where like this idea of being able to run like databases on like are not databases run applic .NET applications on non Windows platforms is a thing, right? Like. And I, I I immediately think, okay, so .NET, that means that it's like the underlying operating system is Windows, which as we all know in technology is not the best operating system to run like really high performance applications, not to knock Windows. Um, but like, I mean, I'd love to kind of get your thoughts as like the cross platform aspect of that, right? Like the ability to run solutions, you know, on Windows versus, Linux or Mac or whatever, you know, I, we were talking in the reason why I asked this is because you were showing a Raspberry Pi earlier, right? Like Dion has this cool demo where he has a Raspberry Pi and he's like, hey, look at this cool thing. Like all this really, really small hardware, he can do really, really cool stuff with it. I, I'd love to get your thoughts is like, when does it become challenging to have things stay on Windows from a data database platform perspective versus on something like Linux or Mac? So uh, RavenDB has this uh, uh, legacy of starting with uh, in 2009 with C Sharp uh, on .NET framework, which was running yeah. only on Windows. Later on, as .NET uh, converted into a multi-platform thing, RavenDB also started supporting it. Mm -hmm. But you know, this legacy is so so uh, heavy that even to this day, people have this prejudice that yeah. RavenDB runs only on Windows. And uh, from my perspective, uh, Linux won the server battle. So somehow I expect to have a desktop, Windows desktop. If I go to command line, I, I like Bash more than PowerShell. Sure, if sure. I go to deploy somewhere, I would choose uh, maybe Docker running on Ubuntu, or I would install Alpine Linux as very small, uh, uh, fast and secure uh, platform. But overall, when you look at it, uh, with the emergence of containers, it's it's all level field now. Yeah, we are all like I'm working on Windows and compiling and deploying to the Docker container which runs uh, Linux on my machine. Yep. And yeah, I think I'm very excited about the WebAssembly mm -hmm. because for me, 
if you recall what Java applet promise yeah. was, I look at the WebAssembly as Java applets 2.0, and I hope for the day to see native support in all operating systems, and that hopefully will be game over, will be proceeding to something more exciting than platform chasing. Yeah, and the Java applets, I've never heard like the, the WebAssembly to Java applets comparison. Like it's very, very interesting. I'll have to look into that a bit more. I mean, and, and just for folks, you know, that, that do care or might be questioning, like I just looked at the source code right now because RavenDB is on GitHub. RavenDB, you can target .NET 7, which is the latest version of .NET as of this recording, which is in March of 2023, right? So you can run RavenDB on Linux or Windows, the latest version of .NET, which is cool. Um, I think one thing too that I'd love to kind of get your thoughts on, and this is just as an observer, like, you know, when you talk about NoSQL, there are a lot of flavors of NoSQL, right? Like, you know, you can go down the, like key value stores, that's an option, or graph, or like in the case of RavenDB, like having a more like document store approach. Like, you know, when are, is it the, is it just depending on the use case to use different types? Or have you seen over time, that it's easy to go from here to here because the APIs are similar or because the implementations are similar. When, you, when, it, when it, again, looking at the inception, uh, yeah. various NoSQL databases were developed to solve specific problems. Sure. So Neo4j, uh, I, I, when, when, I, uh, ha, I'm, when I have in workshops, I usually go with, uh, okay, with NoSQL, metadata sometimes becomes more important than the data itself. When you look at sure. the graph databases, Metadata is actually more important than the data itself. You're keeping track of all these connections, and now with the emergence of AI solutions, uh, uh, more flavors of these interconnections exist. So I would compare your what you're asking me. I would compare it. I would go back to that Ted Neward and polyglot programming. Yeah, yeah. So this was when it was legitimized to have more than one language on a project and this nicely fit into the microservices story. And I would like to go to the microservices and remind people that usually people will tell you that microservices are there for scaling. Mm -hmm. But I would say they are more for scaling teams than actual scaling of the traffic. Interesting. Yeah. Because imagine if you, if, if you have 500 developers, how you would organize them. Yes. How you would coordinate them. So people are not aware that microservices at least have important so socio aspect as they have technological aspect important. So on the lines of polygon programming, it comes down to the databases and uh, it's okay nowadays to use several databases on a project, even for a monolith project, if you need to provide full text search and if you need to provide general purpose, and you, if you need to store time series data, you may end up using one or two or three databases, or specifically if, you, if you're developing microservices which have uh, coverage of specific bounded context, like uh, product catalog search, yeah. uh, shopping cart, yep. whatever, then it's up to you to pick up as a good engineer the best tech stack for that to implement, to deliver, and to proceed. Yeah, I mean it's it's interesting, and I, but I th in a and just to turn this a little bit right, I think one of the things that I struggle with is like a little bit of analysis paralysis, right? Like there are so many options. We talked we talked about this a little bit earlier, right? I mean, I, I love the idea of. Like if you can get right to the problem that a particular solution is trying to solve, right? Um, like I, I, we talked about this it's just for some backstory. Like Dan and I were were both at a conference together a few months ago, and we were talking about some stuff. And one of the things that I mentioned is like the idea that, like I know that RavenDB solves a particular problem, right? I can't say that about every database platform, but I've used RavenDB and I know it solves a particular problem. I can say the same thing about Elasticsearch or MongoDB or what have you. I think what I like the most, when, the first thing that I look at is like how is how easy it is to set it up or how how accessible it is to get started and how configurable it is. 
Like, what are some of the things that you see, um, you know, when you talk to people about using RavenDB? Like, what are some of the things that you that you think of? Like, oh, this is the problem that RavenDB is very good at solving. So you will be surprised now what I what I underline security, but in what sure. sense? Imagine you have some kind of a system and you have all top notch state of the art uh, security approaches, techniques, algorithms, certificates, whatever. Now, my question is, if it takes you to read 50 pages manual or wait for an expert to help you set it up, configure everything, what is probability that you will leave it up for later or not do it or do it in a wrong, incomplete way, etc. So part of the hard work of the team behind RavenDB is about making hard things easy to use and approachable. So for example, if you go to the Shodan IO, which is Internet of Things uh, search engine, yep. if you if you search for Elasticsearch, you will see hundreds and maybe thousands of exposed instances. And this is one of the reasons that, for example, even Microsoft got I don't know what term to use because it's not hacking, it's not breaching, it's walking through the open doors. Yep. This is because it's not easy to protect or harden whatever term you want to use, cluster you set up. Sure. So if you, if you make security easy to implement, then people, people will do it easily. Everyone will do it. If you, so uh, th there's mantra. Uh, you should make uh, hard things easy and then people will be happy to use it yeah i don't disagree at all. so it's it's security is you remember kevin mitnick and the way he was doing hacking so it's a combination of like socio-technical components yeah so the thing here is to implement state-of-the-art uh, security measurements and then embed this within the process in the same way that for example you know Quality should be integral part of the software development process. You cannot put Q and A people at at the end of the process. They will just be able to discover bugs that your developers are creating. For that reason, even some people are claiming dedicated QA departments to be anti pattern because then developers are thinking, okay, here is something who will test my code. But testing, well, as good the extra stated that uh, testing can only discover the presence of the bugs. Yeah. So I would say that, like, thinking few steps ahead, how people are going to use this in the wild. So, for example, with RavenDB, even if you don't protect it, if you if you leave it running on a protected subnetwork, it's still rejecting every single request which is coming from outside. So after two years, you 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 lift protection from the subnetwork; it's completely open. Database will reject any requests which are not coming from the loopback device. So I think this design approach is is something very interesting. Yeah. It's not technical feature, it's, it's the design of the installation of usage and overall usage patterns of, of the database itself. Yeah, at the end of the day, it's about protecting yourself, right? Like, I think, you know, rightfully so, it's very, very important, especially in the concept of data, like making sure that access to that data is as limited as possible by default, right? So like, I, I love the idea that, you know, when you go about building out an instance at RavenDB, like security is one of the first principles that we address, which is awesome. Like, um, I also think in general, like, and this is just maybe, I don't want this to be like a product pitch, but like the UI for RavenDB, I love it. Like, I, I love the web UI for it. Um, but that's, you know, I think that's a really, really cool thing too. I, I think one of the things that, that I'd love to kind of get your thoughts on too, as we kind of, as we kind of wrap up our conversation about database platforms or data sources is, you know, obviously if you're a developer, the, you care about getting access to the data, but it's really, really important to think about like the things that when you run a query against a data source, like how efficient that query is like what are some, I, and this is just a question because i love to hear it like what are some of the worst execute execution times you've seen people write right when they come to build like when they are trying to you know write some query that has some joins to it or they're trying to get it across different clusters like what are some of the the, the best 
uh, the the worst performer stuff you've seen. I'd love to hear it. I'll tell you from the first hand. In my previous <laughs> company, I observed Query, which was running on Aurora AWS, which was executing for several days, and I was wow. I wasn't even aware something like this is possible. And I have this typical question when I talk to some people when I sense the usage patterns. I ask them, okay. Are you allowing your business intelligence department to run reporting on during the working hours? Yeah. Because if you have a report generation, which is essentially aggregation, nothing spectacular, or it shouldn't be, uh, spiking CPU to 100% and killing your application in production, mm -hmm. and then you go and spin up a read replica for BI department, or you tell them, okay, only Monday morning before 9, yeah. 9 a.m., this is a sign that something is not good. I don't know what, but database should be engine. Uh, uh, I wrote on one occasion that database should be like a window. Windows on your house. When you're going yeah. to pay attention to them? if there's something wrong with them, if they're yes. broken, they're yes, malfunctioning. So database should be boring. Then it will be exciting for you. That's I, I mean. I love the window analogy because it's so true. Like you don't pay attention to things that are outside of your vision until they start to cause you problems, right? Uh, so I love that approach and like the idea of like, I mean, we don't all don't have the luxury of like, of having the capacity to spin up like a read-only environment of a large database. Like that's that's fair. But like I like you mentioned, like don't have things that are just spiking CPU constantly running at the same time as mission critical like work, like revenue driving growth, right? Revenue driving uh, activities. I mean, that's great. I love to kind of, you know, transition our conversation a little bit to like, you know, and this is something we were talking about a little bit earlier before we got started about like mentorship and like this next thing, like empowering the next level of technologists. Like what are some of the things that, um, that you see in your mentorship when you're mentoring uh, folks that are getting started or startups or what have you, that you see like, what are some of the things that they bring that you don't think of? And what are some of the things that they have assumptions about that are, in your opinion, not always correct? Well, to start with the incorrect, incorrect assumptions, and I was also thinking the following thing when I was younger. Uh, when you're working in a workplace as a young person, Sometimes you will think, OK, what could get me fired? And then, of course, you work not only to, to advance your career, but to prevent your, your position. And yeah. when I was younger, I was always thinking that technical in, incompeten incompetency will get me fired. Mm. As years were passing, I realized that I, I did not witness a single case of, of uh, people being fired off over technical aspect of their jobs. Sure. It's always soft skills. It's always maybe being stubborn or being like you have team leads and uh, every single team lead is maybe rejecting to work with you. And then this is your way out of the company. So sure. I think this this soft, we all learn technologies. You know, when you go and uh, you listen to the courses, you write code, but it's, it's actually collaboration. It's, it's like, Writing software is actually when when you start writing software at the very beginning of the project, you, you're at, at, at the very beginning of discovering domain you're building software for. And it's kind of, kind of collective learning process, discovering domain, uh, correcting things on the fly, things like that. So I think this collaboration aspect is, is not valued enough. Ability yeah. to articulate yourself, ability to listen to people. When I was leading teams, I was never imposing my technical decisions. I was always following this principle. If I'm proposing solution, I should give arguments strong enough that my teammates accept it because of the arguments, not because I'm, I'm positioned higher than they, uh, than they are. If I'm using this like uh, argument of force, it's because I'm telling you to, to do it this way, this is my defeat. I wasn't able to defend my technical decision. So if, if there's a single thing that I, I uh, could recommend or what I think is important is also 
taking care of development of these stuff soft skills. That that's I I, I don't even know where to start there because I think there's some really really interesting things there. I think like it is true like the idea of soft skills and you know having being able to is like the 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 the, the worst way I can say it is like being able to talk business right talk business or, or talk politely it is something that isn't directly taught a lot it's either you it's either you have or you don't have like i had a, i had a job in college and um the, my manager said i can teach you how to fix a computer i can't teach you how to have a conversation with somebody and not be rude or not come off as as mean or be little people i can't teach you that but i can teach you how to fix a computer and that that kind of dawned on me, like this idea, like some people are capable of being a bit more effective in that sense. And it's really, really important, especially if you're starting a business or you're getting started. Like, you know, I think you and I will be the first people to say, like, you know, we've all worked with people that are hard to work with, not because they can't deliver the work, but because we're talking with them or engaging with them is not enjoyable. Right. So what are some of the things that maybe tools that you've learned, you know, from these discoveries that you kind of give back to people? Is it as simple as like being empathetic? Is it thinking about other people before you say things? Like what are some of the, the tricks that you've used to kind of combat, you know, because I think a lot of us suffer from, to an extent, some level of, uh, you know, being rough around the edges. Well, probably for me personally, because I like to talk a lot, it would be like... <laughs> Trying to be calm, listening to people. Yes. That would be. But if I would pick up one activity that could cover all these areas, it it would be try to build your own product. Because yeah. you just said like putting technology in the context of what we are doing and what for we are doing. So we are not writing code for the sake of writing code most of the, the times. We are doing it to solve some problems to achieve something. So yeah. if you try to, if you're a young developer, if you try to build your hobby project into small product from the scratch, if you try to launch website, do some uh, simple marketing campaign, try to market it, try to promote it, then you will look at all the aspects and you, then you will realize that probably engineering part is the smaller than you thought, smaller contributing factor to the su success of whole uh, company and then you will probably value more people who are doing marketing and sales and uh, CEOs and if you ever try to hire someone to help you will see that being small micro CEO is very hard so probably this will put you in right perspective in the same way when you start traveling abroad you can put you your culture your country in more uh, in a, in a better perspective, you have better worldview when you when you widen your uh, sight. That's great. I mean, I think that's, you know, and we're about to wrap up now. I think this is a great place to end it, right? Like the, just, you know, I, I love the analogy of like traveling, right? You want to bring the best of yourself or you want to take as much as possible to kind of better yourself. Um, and I, so I really appreciate that little bit of insight. And, you know, as we wrap up, I love to ask my guests you know, one final question. And, you know, that question, it's if you could think of technology or open source, the community around it, but you only had one word to describe the way you feel, what would that word be for you, Dan? Proud. Proud. I, I love it. Yeah, that's great. Um, that's excellent. Yeah, and that's and that's our show. I mean, I really enjoyed having the conversation here. This was great. We talked about all sorts of fun topics. You know, before we part, do you have any parting words? Well, uh, I'm grateful uh, for the opportunity to speak about some things. Yeah. Uh, and I hope I'll be uh, this passionate about software in 10 or 20 years. I think we all can hope for that. So, awesome. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in and listening in in the future. Uh, and, you know, I, I hope you have a great day. My name is Isaac Levin. Thanks for listening to Coffee and Open Source. Take care.